All right, we're going to start it now. Uh, thank you all for participating in this webinar on the T81 to 2010 climate normal and for your patience on um, while we had um, the people not able to log into the WebEx accommodated. Um, so the point of this webinar here is to give you a sense of what we're going to release on July 1st. So we really want you to be able to hit the ground running on first once the normals are released. And I should mention the new normals are part of a suite of climate-related services that NOAA provides for the nation. It is one of our most popular products here. For going along, we're, I'm going to tell you what uh, slide we're on, and we're going to change slides right now. Slide two. So I'm going to start and end this talk with some of the takeaway messages. So takeaway, you know, you know just these bullet points, that would be great. Nine points here. Number one, most of the normals will be available July 1st via FTP. Number two, if you're with the National Weather Service, those normals will be uploaded in day with August 1st. Number three, we're using daily data much more than we did in the last installment of normals. Number four, we've um, constructed temperature normals to be internally consistent across all the uh, time scales daily, monthly, annual, and seasonal. Number five, we have a much more comprehensive suite of precipitation normals this time. Number six, and cooling days are computed much more directly this time. Number seven, we are including hourly normals for the first time for about 260 stations. Number eight, we are computing what we call pseudo normals for record stations that in the past probably would not have had normals computed for them at all. And they, on average, 1981 and 2010 normals will be warmer than 1971 to 2000 normals on average. Slide three. This is the end of today's webinar. We're first going to provide some background and overview of the climate normals. A product. Then go into detail on what you should expect on July 1st. Different variables, access, etc. We're then going to go over what the National Weather Service releases and how that compares to what the public will be receiving. We'll talk about temperature normals, including heating days and cooling degree days, and then we'll highlight the precipitation and snow normals. We'll discuss pseudo normals and CRN normals, and then at the end we'll present some preliminary results. Slide four. Here we're doing the of NOAA's climate normals. This slide is actually from the 1971 to 2000 product. The main parameters are temperature that includes maximum, minimum, and mean temperature, heating, cooling degree days, precipitation, and snowfall at the monthly, seasonal, and annual time scale. Essentially, a climate normal is a 30-year average. And the reason that we do normals here is because a mandate of the World Meteorological Organization, missions of the WMO mandate are mandated to compute their normals every 30 years. So the 1931 to 1960 period, the 61 to 1990 period, and then forthcoming 1991 to 2020 period will be mandated set of climate normals. However, WMO also recommends member nations to recompute their normals every 10 years. In effect, it's our census of climate station data. The current set of FEMA recommended normals are 1971 to 2000. Those will be the current set of normals until we release our new normals July 1st. And the next schedule period is 1981 to 2010. Uh, the next slide, number five. Uh, so essentially what we are doing is dropping one decade and picking up a recent one. That's, that's one way to look at the normals is that, you know, we're getting rid of you know, the balls and everything that's in 1970s and picking up, you know, Google and everything that's happened in the last decade. So that's one way to consider this installment of normals. Next slide. Here we're showing the accounts and data set information for the 1981 and 2010 climate normals. So what we're providing here is a rounded station count. For temperature, we plan to have about 7,500 stations with normals, about 
8,700 precipitation and a subset of 7,6400 will include snowfall normals. About 5,300 will include snow depth normals. We also have about 260 on stations that have normals for us as well. So what are the source data sets for the normals project? Well, the primary data set is the Global Historical Climatology Network daily data set. We all have for our hourly normals data we pick up from a NCDC product we know, uh, that we call ISD light. And all normal station IDs when we actually produce these normals, it's all going to be based on what the identifying codes are in GHCN daily. All right, seven. So you can expect to see on July 1st. On July 1st, we're going to be providing all daily, monthly, seasonal, and annual normals of station-based temperature, precipitation, snowfall, and snow depth, as well as hourly normals for 260 first-order stations. We will provide so briefing files, documentation, station lists, and metadata as well at that time. We'll also have instructions for accessing our web page, and this is the link to our web page there. And this uh, this station is being recorded, so you can always come back and get this link or copy and paste it right now as a bookmark. All right, number eight. What you might expect to see on July 1st. Um, I mentioned, you know, stepping back a little bit here for the the 1971 to 2000 normals, those were actually released over a three-year period, and first normals did not come out until September of 2001. So what we decided to do this year was actually try to release as much as we can by the point of this year and release everything else by the end of this year. So try to get everything out in one calendar year, and in, in fact, we are releasing about 80% of the normals by the first. But sometimes you should not expect to receive July 1st. Most agricultural related normals, such as frost freeze date normals. And the that this requires complete daily data or simulations, which you know we need to work on that. Um, spatial aggregations of normals, such as climate division normals or grid normals, will not be available right now. Nor will population weighted normals, such as monthly heating and cooling degree days, because that requires new census data, which we have yet to acquire. But much everything else will be available, and we'll go over in subsequent slides on what on the variables you will be able to get. So slide nine, we show temperature normals that, that will be released July 1st. This is at the daily time scale, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, average, temper, average temperature, the diurnal temperature range, heating and cooling degree days, as well as the standard deviations of daily values. Much the same will be provided at the monthly time scale. Actually, we also have what we call count normals at the monthly scale. That's, for example, the number of days per month above degrees Fahrenheit. We call those count normals. We'll be providing that at the monthly seasonal annual scale. And exclusively at the monthly scale, we're providing what's known as midnight observing time offsets. And this is and we do our computation, our standardization of the monthly temperature normals. Actually, um, standardize the observations such that they were all observed at midnight. And then the normals themselves are reported as if there was a local observing time. But we're also providing you with the offset if you want to convert your normals back to a midnight observing time. So it's the annual scale. We are doing much the same Tmax, Tmnt, average DTR, degree days, and count normals. Next slide. Here we go with precipitation statistics we're producing for the 1981 to 10 climate normals. Let me step back for a second. Note everything here in black or in bold for the temperature normals. Again, we're on slide nine. Everything bold is part of receivable the variable that the National Weather Service will receive. Anything bold here will be included in what we provide to the National Weather Service. Back to slide 10, 
Again, these are the precipitation statistics we're producing for 1981 and 2010. Uh, it can be summarized as three classes of products, averages, frequencies, and percentiles. For precipitation and snowfall, we're providing average monthly totals, month-to-day totals, average year-to-day totals, average of days per month exceeding various thresholds, monthly frequencies exceeding various thresholds. And I should mention that the thresholds that we use for precipitation and snowfall are different. We're also including percentiles of uh, the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles of monthly values and daily values. First step, we are including average number of days per month exceeding various thresholds, daily or frequency exceeding various thresholds, as well as the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile values. Hourly normal. I want hourly normals in particular because I know that there's a lot of folks on the energy industry on the line, which you know I've been interacting with closely over the last couple of years, and the hourly normals that we're producing is by and large a result of interactions with the energy industry, which has been pushing for more information at hourly time scale. So this is really the fruition of our user engagement with the energy industry action that we are including hourly normals as part of 1981 to 2010 climate normals. So hourly scale, again, this is for about 260 stations. We are providing normals of air temperature, pressure, dew point temperature, heat index, Heat days, I'm sorry, heating degree hours, which is the analog at the hourly scale of heating degree days, cooling hours, cults, winds, and wind chill. Slide we're on slide 12 now. So we're going to go over what the, the weather service deliverable is. So NCDC provides the National Weather Service with a, with a special delivery deliverable for loading into AWIPS. So, well, you know, for years that um, are not familiar with National Weather Service and NTDC, um, National Weather Service and NTDC are both part of NOAA, which is part of the Department of Commerce. But the Weather Service is actually its own line office, and NTDC is part of NESDIS, which is a separate line office. We are providing the National Weather Service with a special delivery, uh, special deliverable, which includes a subset of 700 stations, mostly ASOS, and it's only a fraction of our back portfolio. For example, uh, their service will not be receiving the hourly normals. They'll be receiving just limited thresholds of our books, that kind of thing. So then what National Weather Service will do is we'll be providing them the deliverable on July 1st, just like we're releasing to the public on July 1st. But the Weather Service is planning to upload these normal into AWIPS by first. So if, any, if, if anyone needs more information on the National Weather Service deliverable, please contact Jim Z. He might be on the line, but if you don't know Jim Z and you're in a National Weather Service, your climate focal point will be able to direct you to him. So here we go over the, the basic computation of 1971 to 2000 normals so that we can compare and contrast with the 1981 to 2010 normals. Let me have to use the mouse here. So we start with the actual observing networks, first order network station, and the vast majority of our data comes from the, the volunteer cooperative network. The first thing that we do is called standardization. That's where we apply a time of observation correction quality control, statistics, and on station history, as well as missing data estimation. And we, there, um, we then arrive at standardized monthly year sequential data. And from here, we um, compute the normals as 30-year averages of means, totals, and standard deviations. But we arrived at monthly normals last time. And to go to monthly scale to the daily scale, we implied fit calculations last time and things that changed location during the last 30 years, the center edition was based on the current location. Slide, slide 14 is just meant to emphasize that, you know, spline fit calculations were done last time, which we will not be doing this time. And we started with month year data. No daily data were used. Um, some data were used for um, part of the first order network stations just for heating and cooling degree days. 
but E for that spline fitting was still used to get the daily values. We won't be doing spline fitting this time. We'll be using daily data a lot for the 1981 to 2010 normals. Next slide, slide 15. This is a little chart of normals products derived from temperature data. So we start with standardized monthly temperature data. We actually give um, presence and precedence to the monthly temperature values because of the robust quality control done at the monthly scale. So the FEP is actually to compute monthly temperature normal. We incorporate daily data from GHT and daily. And so we ensure consistency between the monthly and the daily scale is through a, a technique called the constrained harmonic fit, which I'll talk about in a subsequent slide. But the constrained harmonic fit is how we get daily temperature normals that are consistent with the monthly temperature normals. On these daily temperature normals, we're able to, again, grab the and daily to uh, compute daily departures from the normal. And from everything else falls out, we can compute daily degree day normals and count normals the number of days per month above 90, for example. And then on these daily degree day normals, we're able to accumulate monthly, seasonal, and annual degree day normals. I'll go over this in more detail in subsequent slides. Slide 18, so how to arrive at the normals of Tmax, Tmin, T average, and their normal temperature range. So I mentioned earlier, we give monthly temperature, we give precedence of the monthly temperatures because of the robust quality control and standardization done at the monthly time scale. We obtain stations that have at least 10 non-missing and non-suspect years for each month of the year. Next step is the uh, missing monthly values analysis of index of agreement. And once we have those in monthly values for all 30 months of the year, we simply take the 30-year the, the average for each month of how, how many missing values we had and track that as a flag. And that's how we start with, we that start the process by computing the month temperature normals. So once monthly temperature normals, from the, the daily temperature normals, Daily temperature normals of Tmax, Tmin, Tavrage, and ETR are computed using daily temperature data. So in order to get the annual cycle, we use harmonic analysis, which is a linear combination of sines and cosines. For consistency with the monthly normals, we use what's called constrained minimization. And this allows us to ensure that the monthly normals are consistent with the daily normal. For example, Let's already say that the average um, max at least go for June in Asheville, North Carolina, where we are, is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So the constraint minimization forces the three daily normals we get for Tmax and Asheville to average out to be exactly what the monthly temperature normal is. So that's how we ensure consistency between the daily and monthly scale through this constraint harmonic analysis. In effect, what we're doing is we're passing through the quality control and standardization done at the monthly time scale to the daily time scale, and really all temperature normals are consistent in that the quality control and standardization done at the monthly time scale is present in one form or another in all of the products that we do. That's really the temperature. Next slide 18 uh, combination of heating and cooling degrees. Last uh, time we focused on the Tom method, which is a way of of animating monthly degree days are, you know, on monthly normals and standard deviations. And from there, spline fitting was used to arrive at daily values. So it's a pretty indirect way of computing heating and cooling degree days. What we decided to do was actually use as much daily data as we could to compute these degrees in a more direct fashion. So we actually start with the daily T average normals this time. The key is to actually measure the spread about the daily temperature average normals. And so we use a moving window about the, the central day and the daily normal. So the HDD, CDD normals are then scaled averages of the relative distributions that we've computed based on the spread. And once we have the daily normals, of heating and cooling degree days, we accumulate them to arrive at the monthly, seasonal, and annual uh, normals. Last time, we took monthly 
heating and cooling days and use spline fitting to add the daily values. This time we're actually using daily data in a more direct fashion to compare daily HDD and CDD normals and then accumulating to get monthly seasonal and an annual HDD, CDD normal. Slide number 19. This one based on precipitation related normals. This time we have much more daily statistics, including probabilities and percentiles for precipitation, snowfall, and snow depth. Fertilities, these are of measurable amounts and of amount exceeding various higher thresholds. And we have additional probabilities, which are the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles of non-zero amounts. For precipitation and snowfall, we have month-to-date and year-to-date totals that are replacing daily means. So month-to-date and year-to-date normals are used a great deal by uh, folks in water resources or in agriculture that need to know on a good day, you know, water season or in, in the calendar year, how much water normally will have, how much precipitation normally will, will have fallen by a certain date, and then you can compare it to actually fallen, that kind of thing. So that's why we're, we're producing these types of normals. It's largely replacing the daily means, which is essentially we were taking monthly precipitation normals and doing a spline fit through that last time. So at three inches of rain in June, we would essentially divide that number by 30, you know, more or less, and get about a tenth of an inch of rainfall per day. We decided that wasn't a very useful metric, especially, you know, if you have like a monsoon onset that happens to be in the middle of the month. You know, actually doing kind of analysis is not, you know, we didn't think that was a very um, useful value. So we had to provide people with these percentiles and probabilities as well as the, the cumulative normals, the month-to-date and year-to-date normals to give you more information as to what's going on with precipitation. For response to note that, so this is being done this time at several thousand stations, as I mentioned earlier, whereas last time this was limited to several hundred stations. And for 20, this reduced the concept of pseudo normals. Um, pseudo normals is basically a way of estimating what you expect the normal to be in the future when you've actually gotten, you know, 10 of the years of data for the record stations. And it's based on a uh, paper by Sun and Peterson from 2005. So, what you essentially is a linear combination of the normals from neighboring stations using overlapping data records to establish the weighting or the relationship. So, for example, if a station has only been around three years, we're able to provide an pseudo normal for it, meaning it's an estimate of what we expect, our best guess of what the normal will be based on the three years of record that we have, on how this station is reporting relative to its neighboring stations that have longer records. So, in order to do this, we the station must meet several criteria. It must be two years of non and non-suspect values for each month of the year, and it must be an active station, which we measure by determining whether there's at least one value in 2010. And it must be sufficient neighbors, you know, we're having some problems with computing pseudonormals in Alaska because there's not sufficient neighbors to do this, and not sufficient neighbors, we don't compute pseudonormals for that station. So this includes um, the reference network stations. If you're not familiar with the climate reference network, this is a network network that's run, um, it's specific design to be a reference network for climate. You know, the vast majority of the, the stations that we have were designed to measure weather, not so much climate. But this climate reference network is designed specifically to do climate, and there's about 125 stations, um, 125 CRN uh, stations. And the thing is that they didn't start until 2001, so we can't really do the regular normals for them, but we can do pseudo normals for them because there are you know, over 100 of them that have at least two years of data. So CM normals will be included in our normals product. So I'm going to with some preliminary results. I'm going to show two graphs here. The first one is. Um, the monthly temperatures change from the 1981 to 2010 period versus 1971 to uh, 2000 period for July maximum temperature. And the next slide will be um, January minimum temperature. The reason that we're showing July maximum temperature is because it's the 
warmest part of the day by for the warmest month of the year. And I mentioned here before I get into the results, this is an apples to apples comparison, meaning that we recomputed in 1971 and 2000 almost using the same exact methodology and standardization in order to, you know, so, so that these comparisons are actually in the same standardization and it's not based on different methodologies from last time. It's actually using the same methodology this time. So based on this, what we're seeing is that uh, July maximum temperatures have been warmer in the western third United States. You know, some sort of warming in this area here and some cooling in the middle part of the country. Yeah, that January minimum temperature, we see a more drastic change. Uh, what we're seeing here is is in a lot of the country, we're seeing much warmer conditions in January minimum temperature. Um, in the northern United States, this is exceeding two degrees Fahrenheit. So the change in the normals is exceeding two degrees Fahrenheit, which means that this most recent decade, 2001 to 2000, was actually average at least six degrees Fahrenheit warmer in January minimum temperature. The 1971 to 1980 period, so the 1970s, uh, everyone knows it was a cold decade, especially so in minimum temperature in January. Some preliminary results I should mention these data are preliminary, as it says at the bottom, and subject to change prior to July 1st. These pre figures were apples to apples comparisons, statewide averages which we're knowing, but statewide averages of annual normals of Tmax and Tmin show that 1981 to 2010 normals are warmer than 1971 to 2000 normals for all states in the low 48 states. So every single state um, average annually is seeing warmer normals time than last time. So we're also doing what we call apples to oranges comparisons. Uh, this refers to um, comparing what we are producing now from 1981 to 2010 versus what was actually reported last time, even though it's different methodology. So it's apples to oranges because there were different methodologies, QC standardization. But it's really where the rubber meets the road for our users. It's what they're actually seeing us report. So we're also providing that comparison. Um, so we've had about 5,000 stations that were used last time and this time for temperature. What we're seeing is that for T max, there's not much difference on average for max, but we half the months have been have become warmer, half the months have become cooler. The largest absolute change is about a one degree increase in January on average. For T average, we're actually seeing an increase of about 0 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Increases across every single month. And the change is once again in January. So on average, minimum temperatures in January are one degree or 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normals that were reported last time. So now I'm going to end with the same exact takeaway messages that I started with. Number one, most normals will be available July 1st via FTP. Number two, national service normals will be loaded into AWIPS August 1st. Number three, using much more daily data this time to compute the normals. Number four, temperature normals are internally consistent. Number five, we have a more comprehensive suite of precipitation normals. Number six, heating and cooling degree day normals are computed much more directly this time. Number seven, we're including hourly normals for about 260 stations. Number eight, we're actually providing some normals for short record stations. And lastly, number nine, on average, 1981 to 2010 was warmer than 1971 to 2000. So for information, you can go to this website once again. It includes frequently questions and other information. And if you have any questions, you can contact me at anthony.rosa.noah.gov with any other questions that you might have. I won't be terribly responsive um, between now and July, but I'll probably get back to you as soon as I can. And with that, I think we can go to any questions that might appear in chat and try to answer those questions. Load all. OK, 
if you have any questions and you are on X, please uh, direct them to me in the chat and we'll go over any questions. If, if there are questions, we might be able to open up the telecom line and, and have to ask questions over the, the line. Okay, so we have one question from Ed Lynch. It says, daily HDD CDD temps look smooth like a TMY, which is a typical meteorological year. The answer is yes. All normals will be smooth. Um, the temperature normals at the daily time scale will be smooth because we're using our harmonic fit analysis. Um, heating and cooling degree day and, and cooling degree day normals will be smooth as well, not only because of the nature of the way that we computed them, because we 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 provide we we use an adaptive filter to actually smooth out some of the bumps in the calculation. So yes, these normals will be smooth. Another question from Greg Uden. Are month normals based on homogenized time series data? If so, will those data be available? Okay. Monthly normals are based on homogenized time series. We're calling it standardization now. And we are providing all the code used to produce the normal as well as the underlying daily uh, daily and monthly data used. So the answer to that is yes. Uh, question from Ed Lynch. Will normals look smooth? Okay, I answered that. So the question was asked more than once. Okay, two more questions here. Jalahan, what data will be released? Gridded and aggregate product. What will be released with the gridded and aggregate product? Uh, so Russ, I'm chiming in here now on the gridded product. It's uh, safe to say that you're going to get a lot of the same parameters: maximum temperature, minimum temperature, merge temperature, uh, precipitation, heating and cooling degree data. The same general. Information. We won't necessarily have any of the count normals available. We won't be doing snowfall or snow depth. All right. We'll by the way be both monthly and daily. All right. I mentioned that we have our whole normal team assembled here to answer these questions. So that was Russ Bose, but M. Kadura, who's in charge of the precip normal. Uh, Apple, uh, <laughs> Scott Applequist is in charge of the hourly normal. Um, Mike Squire is helping out on precip. And Chungan is helping out with the comparison. All right, question from Linda Keller. Will any products be grid point data in addition to just individual stations? I think Russ Vos just answered that question. Yes, we are having gridded normals, which we've been out right now. Don, should plots of anomalies from gridded data use a 1981 decline if possible? Well, I mean, that's one of the main reasons that we compute um, normals is so it's so it's for the computation of anomalies. So, so you know, we recommend that you would use the most recent set of normals. They are using our normals, and yes, we would recommend using 1981 to 2010 anomalies. Maltic, when will the new normals migrate to ACES? Uh, that's not a question I can answer. ACES is not technically part of NTDC. I believe Keith Eggleston. Um, someone from the Northeast Regional Climate Center, or perhaps someone from the High Plains Regional Climate Center will be able to answer that. Um, I can get back to you on that. William Schmidt, will the ACES data load populate the now data ACES tools? Again, that's not National Weather Service speak, which I'm not familiar with. You'll have to direct that question to Jim D. And what will the spatial resolution state? I know what the spatial resolution will be if the gridded field is under kilometers. Thanks, Russ. Okay, yeah. I've got Marina asking a question. Hi, Marina. Uh, the official normal different than the normals computed by homogenized data set? The answer is no. John says, thank you. Um, let's see if there's any other. Okay. So 
I don't see any more questions via the chat, so we might be able to open this up. Oh, there are more here. Let's see. Getting this in different windows. Greg Boone, Theresa Corn. Okay, Jeff Boyne asks, why are the normals, why are we changing the normals in August and holding off until January 1, 2012, like the rest, like the last set of the 30 year normal? That's actually a common question that we're getting because you know we're we're releasing these normals in the middle of the the warmest part of the year, and you know for energy companies that's actually kind of problematic to be you know messing around with anomalies um, when it's you know peak season for for cooling. Um, the reason won't surprise you. We're actually releasing these normals as soon as we can. Um, factoring in all the different sets of users that we have, we decided that you know we would get these normals out as we can, you know, sensitive to, you know, that it might be for some of our folks that are getting this in July, um, the main answer is we wanted to get this out to folks as quickly as possible. Uh, question from Philip Pasteris. If misses, have you established any of the missing precision? Was this done at the monthly time scale or not? Oh, right. have estimated any of the missing precipitation, was this done at the monthly time scale or other? Um, Imka, would you like yes. to that? Um, yes, the uh, monthly precipitation totals. Using the uh, deviation regression technique that was used for the temperature estimates. And we're not estimating anything on daily time scale, and we're also not estimating Snowfall or anything on it, just no depth. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Okay. Hey, John. Will day normals be in hold degrees or in tens? Daily normals of temperature will be in hold degrees. I'm sorry, will be in tens. That's a good question. We didn't talk about the, the vision that we're providing or the, the, the units actually. Day temperature normals as well as monthly temperature normals will be reported in tenths of degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, question from Michelle Margrath. Will there be a list of stations that normals and pseudo normals are available for prior to July 1st? Also, will there be a way to determine which stations are pseudo normals? Absolutely, in terms of the latter part. Well, let me answer the first part. We won't be providing anything before July 1st. Um, uh, but yes, we are including flags in, in values. Um, one of those flags will be telling you that the uh, has pseudo normals for not regular normals. Um, just give you a heads up, if you see the Q next to all of the values, that means the station is a pseudo normal. Uh, we'll be we'll have a list of uh, stations that pseudo normals are computed for, and we'll have all of that information there for. John T. Will pseudo normals generated for the new Alabama ACN CRN site stations? I do not know the answer to that. Does anyone know? No. And no. because the answer is no, so it's no. <laughs> um, let's see. I do want to mention that with pseudo normals, we will we will be providing the, we will provide we will be providing users with the the neighboring stations that were used to produce them. So that you can so that you can see where the where the numbers came from. And to add one thing, we're not doing the of the HCNM regional CRN stations because most of them don't have enough data for two years to do anything with. Okay, cool. Um, Tom Bell, currently have to save the data in a text file and then save it in Excel. Any plans to facilitate saving data in Excel? That's a good question. So what we're releasing right now is going to be via FTP, and it's going to be text files, basically. And it's going to be our, um, we're going to have files per station, so you can grab a station and get all of the daily, monthly, seasonal, and annual normals for that station. Or on multiple, the same variable, 
and have files laid out in that format as well. And these are all going to be text files, so that might help you um, if for you know um, importing into Excel. But later on, our data access is going to be providing a more user-friendly interface for users to be able to go and use drop-down menus on a map to be able to see what the normals are. So, you know, we understand that this is a very rudimentary way of providing the normals to you July 1st. It's the quickest way we can get it out to you, and, you know, this more user-refined format is coming. All right, I think I've got more questions. Up here in this window. Okay, that I'm calling him saying thank you. Marina saying thank you. And another question. When you choose boundary seasons, so November, December, January, and December, January, February, what years are you taking into 1981 to 2010 computation? Very good question. Um, actually, we're not doing NDJ. Our definitions of seasons are December, January, February for winter. Um, M for March, April, May for spring, June, August for summer. This is so hard. <laughs> and summer, October, November for fall. Uh, but it's a good because if you're doing DJF, do you include um, December of 1980? And the answer is no. We put everything to the 1981 and 2010 data. We do not use data from 1980 to 2011. Good question. Another question, John Callahan, will the data be released in print format or online only? I don't believe we're going to be having print format this time. Uh, there are access grants to decide that, but I pretty much doubt it in this day and age that we'll be having any print copies of the normals. Let's go down here. Any more questions via chat? Um, so are you on the line? Let's see if you can, um, oh, we have a new question. We'll shape file format. Do you know what that means, Mike? Yes. I, I know what that means, whether we'll make it available. I think that would be up to date access branch. Okay. The yeah, access branch would be able to help you with that if they are able to do that. Hear me, but at this point, since we're not getting more, oh, actually, we just got a very target release for Climb 20. Okay. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Climb 20 is one of the packages, so to speak, that we included normals for last time. Uh, the monthly stuff was called Climb 81. The daily stuff was Climb 84. Climb 20 really had Climb 20 really had everything. It, it had um, extremes. It has the fraud free stuff, it's got uh, the count normals, and it's got everything pretty much. Um, we're actually grouping them into those categories this time. So we're we're releasing um, the majority of the information that was in Climb 20. Not releasing it as a package this time. So, but what you you got for Climb 20 last time, or whatever station or group of stations that you have, that information will be uh, mostly available. And it's not available July 1st, it should be available at the end of the year. That's a good question. And if there's any more questions via the web, please do so in the in the chat or the Q and A boxes. We're hoping that Theresa will unlock the uh, mute so that we can um, get questions from the line. Um, but if not, um, we'll be here a few more minutes to see if any more questions roll in via chat. Okay. Um,
So you should be able to uh, ask questions now. Okay, Risa. Uh, Howard? Yeah, hi. How's it going? Uh, just to follow up to the last message, the last thing you said about the CLIM 20. Uh -huh. um, what was nice about that was is that there were very convenient PDF files for those that a lot of users were very uh, found very useful. Are you saying those will not be available or they won't be available right away? Something that we're going to work with the uh, data access branch, Neil's group, to figure out how they're going to actually be packaging these normal. Um, actually, I agree with that. I, I was actually using those files recently, and it, it is a very tidy way to for these normals. And you know, that's something we're we're working on with access to figure out how we're going to package them. Yeah, I just put my vote in if we can have something like that. Okay. Um, so I'm another question on the line. Uh, uh, that Phil Pastor is asking, are references to the methods you use be posted? Also, yes. When we we provide the documentation and or the README files on July 1st, we will have pretty, pretty uh, thorough descriptions of the methodology and statistical analysis that we're doing. So yes, definitely. And like I said, we're not just providing that. We're also going to be providing all of the code. In Tran is a programming language. If you're not familiar with it, We're providing all of the code and the underlying data for everyone, so you can, you know, actually run the code if you want, change some things, um, you know, use the data set. So all of that will be available July 1st. We would provide PF links to the San Peter soon papers. Um, you, can you speak up? Provide PF links to the San Peterson's papers. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Um, also, um, you had um, that your um, minimum a team in for January. Are you any analysis about the frequency with which those team ins occur at night versus during the day? I didn't that question. You're you get it on on the next to the next to the last page. But the team in for January was about um, six tenths of a degree here. And the, uh, the frequency with which they occurred at night as opposed to during the day. And so we like to answer? I'm not following. But then we did that we don't have that information. But it occurred at night. We have to do that by comparing it with hourly data. So my guess is not, not anytime soon, probably. But that we have the information to do that. Yeah. Okay, we've got another question on the computer here from Melissa Griffin. Do you have any idea per state how many stations that were represented in the 1971 release are no longer in the 1981 release? Um, don't have it per state. I know that we have a lot more stations than last time, though. Um, but we don't have that broken down by state right now. Do release the normals to life, you know, we'll definitely have station list so that you can compare um last time. Uh, a question from Dennis Toby. So on what day should we be assuming that normals would take effect for N C D C National Weather Service products? One July, one August. Okay, for NDC it's definitely July first. Whatever is available July first is what will be used. Um, for my understanding is that for National Weather Service folks, we use um, apes to see what the normals are in their system. Those won't put it into August 1st. So I would imagine in the, in the intervening month that they would still be using the old 1971 to 2010 uh, to 2000 normals. Um, let's see, we've got more questions. Um, will Tran input files be supplied to? I learned. Or in 1970. <laughs> That's where I was born. Um. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. <laughs> um. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> that Fortran got. Will, will the Fortran input files be supplied to? The answer is yes, because they're going to be they're ASCII files, so I mean, you can read them in. Or train or any other language. Well, so, well, right, 
provide the original data that all the code starts with. And then if you ran all of the programs on that, you put them in the within rounding things, you should come different form issues, but this is Phil Portland. Thank you. It's, it, the Fortran program isn't much good without the data, so this is an important <laughs> process. Right. <laughs> yes, I am that old, and I still. The only difference is now that I have a uh, Sigwin compiler on my laptop instead of an IBM 1130. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and punch. I have a punch card. They're great bookmarks, incidentally. <laughs> Can you explain again briefly the midnight offsets? I'll try again. I'm not the best person in the room to do that, but offering to do it. Mike, Russ. Uh, this is Russ. That typically, stations in the cooperative observing network are run by volunteers. And uh, surprisingly, most volunteers choose an observation schedule other than midnight. Uh, stage of the game, most of them will tend to return to 9 a.m. So our normals are ultimately calculated at the, the local manifestation in December 2010. The reason things get a little muddled is as a part of our processing, the intermediate step which first computes, converts everything to midnight because that enables us to detect other problems such as station relocation and so on, um, more greater sensitivity to those tests. So that we convert back to the local observation. So what's the midnight offset that is? Thanks, Russ. I don't have any more on the computer right now. Is is does anyone else online have a question for us? Anthony? Yep. Uh, this is Mark Brooks at NC State University. I've got one question about the pseudo normals. Okay. Uh, are the pseudo normals going to include the calculations for the, the agricultural parameters like the frosts and freezes? And will, will they also include the calculations for uh, precipitation percentiles? Answer about precip precipitation first, okay. Yeah, they will include the percentiles because we can't, uh, we're comfortable doing percentiles with two years of data, I guess. Yeah, the agricultural normals, I seriously doubt that we'll be able to do that for stations that are pseudo normal. There's not enough enough data to create, you know, filled daily data sets um, from that. So, um, actually, no, we won't be able to do that. Thank you. This is Bill in Portland. I, I don't know about using the word pseudo for the normal. There might be a better word like provisional or something else, but if you're kind of eating with your chin when you say pseudo, which means... Well, pseudo is actually... And by 2005, so we're, we're fortunately contained by that. Oh, okay. um, as far labeling, you said the word provisional as part of our labeling of, you know, the flight that, you know, you'll see, you know, how much data we had for each computation of normal. You know, we, we have complete, we've got normal based on the WMO um, definition. We've got representative, and we have a category for provisional. But if you pseudo, that's even, you know, in our mind, that's worse than provisional. So yeah. We're providing this as a service because you know, you know, why wait 10 years when we can give you at least some estimate of what are, and we were actually looking at the error characteristics of the pseudo normals, and they're not as bad as I might expect, even with our chin or otherwise. I, one of the things that when they were doing the solar radiation disks many years ago, they used the term ERAZ, E-R-A-Z-Z, something like that, which means like um, substitute normals. So anyway, um, if you're uh, constrained by that now, just Go with it. We found it's Q for quasi normal because Q was already taken for provisional. <laughs> think of them as quasi normals too. <laughs> I think that actually that might not be a bad uh, approach, but like I say, if you're constrained by the publications, then so be it. Okay, thanks. Uh, on the line, have a question or a comment? Yes. Are there any uh, climate atlas type products produced? Uh, no, we have no plans for that. Other questions? Jim? 
Okay. We're going to get the preliminary results slides that you had, the slides 21 and 22. There are a lot of stations, or it looks like individual stations that are showing up uh, warmer than normal while the rest of the surrounding countryside is, is left um, not. Do you have a, a, any thought why that might be? Which particular are you talking about, or is, is this visible? I guess like 21, uh, the July maximum temperatures where you subtracted the old normals from the new. And if you look in, uh, say, North Carolina, there's a dot roughly where Raleigh is. There are a number of spots up near the Great Lakes, a couple of spots in the plains where it looks like one, maybe just one station is showing up warmer than the rest of the area relative to the old normals. Do you have any thought as to why that might be? Well, part of that is just the intervals that we use for plotting. So you don't really see, you know, we're between negative 5 and positive point. Five. It's clear. So you're really seeing, you know, what their ending values are. So that's, I think that's part of it is that you know, you're seeing stations that are peaking over 0.5 or less than negative 0.5. So it's it's really just a binning or plot issue, we believe. So to actually plot, you know, I, I can show you what the dot maps are so you can get a better sense of what it is. You know, it's, it's just really the nature of this distillation that we did to get these values. So it's not, it's not like the, you know, they're necessarily surrounded by, you know, negative values. Or, or, or values. It's just, it's just a plotting thing. Hey, uh, same, same question here on the preliminary results slides. Uh, what is the uh, grid size product there? Five kilometers. Uh, five kilometers. Five kilometers. And also, will, will it be able in shape file format for user, external user from, from a service perspective? Will that users be, have access to this in shape file format? Would those folks be the point of contact for someone who wants to try and get stuff in a shape file format? Hunter, are you talking about these uh, difference maps here, or are you talking about the product in general? Oh. Uh, this map, I think if you just post the shape file, I don't think that's a, a big deal. Um, the more question about the, say, the gridded normals or the divisional normals, that'll be what the access branch handles, but I don't always suspect that they'll come available Shape files one sort of action option because that's pretty popular. Thank you. Oh crap. We can hear you. <laughs> hey, Dennis Toddy, one more question. Uh we've had some discussions about you know trying to do some some publicity or letting people know that these were coming out. Right. And I know we made a whole lot more progress on that, just trying to make sure that the weather geek community and those that are in heaven gauge that other people know that there are changes that will occur in a few weeks. So that suddenly, you know, a temperature goes from, you know, being near average to two degrees below average or whatever it was. Right. I mean, we've been reaching people in various different formats. Um, just in this week, we've had over 130 people logged in. Um, and it's not just um, NOAA or, you know, people in the climate community. You know, we, we were reaching state regulators with this WebEx. We were reaching energy companies. You know, we're really opened this WebEx, for example, up to a lot of different people. And we've been contacting lots of different folks. We've got differently asked questions. Uh, I've done personal webinars with a lot of different agencies. Um, I've done with the National Weather Association. So we've been very active. In the in this your engagement aspect of this project. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, hi Anthony. I uh, actually about your frequently asked questions. I had a uh, uh, I know it's not mentioned in the uh, the webinar really going into the bias correction and the station continuity work that was done on the data. I wonder if you could address that a bit and and a lot of that data will be uh, in the detailed data that you're providing, whether there will be some indication of the discontinuities and how they were applied. Well, we weren't planning on talking about that so much because it's in the references and we're going to be including the references to the many at all 
and Kim Williams papers from 2009. Um, and that's, you know, for those of you that are not familiar with that, this is how the monthly um, normals were standardized. It includes um, of observation bias adjustment as well as what we call a um, pairwise test for homogenization of the, the monthly temperature values. So, yeah, it will be available just in a reference format. We're just going to be referencing those papers. So we're not planning on getting into too much detail there. Any questions? All right. Last call for questions. We're, we're, we're running by on the online questions, and um, if, there, if there's any last-minute questions, please ask now or never. Or is there any print, uh, printed format of any of these normals in the future? What is that planned? No, I, I, I seriously doubt that. Um, I'm pretty sure that our access folks Folks will be in everything uh, online. I, I don't believe there will be any printed normal. Yeah, they'll, they'll certainly have functionality that whatever is displayed in a virtual sense, you can print. Right. Um, if there's a need for some sort of official certified copy of something, that's available through the infrastructure here at NCDC as well. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Thank you so much for participating in this webinar. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. And you know, we will. You know, once again, we'll be bringing these normals July first. So look out for them. You know, tell your kids about them. Then, you know, we we hope to follow up with another webinar maybe in late July or, or early August, so that you know, once you've gotten your your already with these normals, you know, we can go and, and provide even more information for you. So thank you guys. Have a good day and appreciate your participation.